Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. What's it like to be on the front lines as a nurse these days? Today, we're here with Jessica Veeker, a certified health and wellness coach and registered nurse who's been working with patients and clients for nearly a decade. In this very special conversation, Jessica is sharing some of the specifics on how to wade through all the hype around keto, why prevention is better than a cure, problems with for-profit medicine, and a whole lot more. Before we get to our conversation, a quick plug. If you're in search of vibrant health, one area that often gets overlooked is getting quality shut-eye. It would be great if we could all turn off technology after sundown, but in real life, it doesn't always work out that way. So here are a couple of quick things that you could try. Number one, thankfully, after many years of this, uh, there are a lot of apps or even built-in modes for PCs, Macs, Androids, Apple phones, and the rest of it that pull out the worst type of blue light after dark. And so sometimes it's called night mode or dark mode. There, there are different apps that can do this like Flux for desktop and, and other platforms. But look into enabling that mode deep in the setting somewhere on your different devices, your phone, your tablet, and your desktop and portable uh, computers can all do this at this point. So that can really help improve your sleep, reduce eye strain, and much, much more. So look for those options, make sure that they're enabled. And then uh, in addition to that, or instead of that as well, you can also look into blue blocking glasses and make sure that they're blocking the right way lengths of light because there are a lot of cheapo knockoff versions out there now, but we're really happy to say that we teamed up with a group of specialists to create our very own blue blocking glasses called Wild RX. If you're new to blue blockers, please check out the daytime variety yellow lenses. In you know nine out of 10 cases, most people will wanna start there, but if you are more advanced and you want kind of the campfire effect, uh, the red lenses for after dark are really excellent. I use these a lot of times in the morning when I wake up before the sun is up. I like to be on my synthesizer and keyboard, which is attached to a computer uh, playing all the instruments, but looking into the monitor uh, when it's that dark out really does cause me a lot of eye strain. So uh, I like using these for intense moments like that, but most of you want to start probably with the yellow lenses. So if you'd like 10% off and, and to be one of the very first people to try WildRx, use the promo code you rock. That's Y O U R O C K for 10% off your entire order. Please go check it out at wildrx.com and don't forget to use the code you rock for an extra 10% off. I really hope you like them. Don't forget to write me. Let me know how you like the yellow lenses or, or the red lenses because they are quite different and quite unique. I hope you dig them. All right, on to this show with Jessica Veeker. We're chatting about how to spot and avoid keto hype, what it's like being on the front front lines of nursing, why prevention is better than a cure, how Jessica healed thyroid issues, problems with for-profit medicine, and tons more. Let's go hang out with Jessica. Hey folks, today we're here with Jessica Veeker, a registered nurse and certified health and wellness coach. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's great to be here, Abel. Thank you for having me. I'm almost losing it right now because I had to try introducing you a whole bunch of times. I'm falling apart today, but I'm really happy to be here with you talking to someone who's a nurse who has also kind of been on, on both sides. And uh, maybe we can start with you talking about some of the, the horrible you know, health adventures you've been through in the past few years. So um, I've been a nurse almost 10 years. Um, and when I first started nursing, I was sick and tired all the time. And I thought it was just adjustment to a new life, hours, all that. I had actually just gotten out of a six year, really emotionally abusive relationship. And I gained like a hundred pounds. Um, I tried traditional dieting, actually had tried Atkins style dieting to get it off. I was having a lot of hormonal dysfunction at the time, which I did not recognize. Um, doctor would run a t TSH only and tell me my thyroid was fine, even though I have a huge family history of thyroid issues, including Hashimoto's. Uh, and it just, nothing I knew about science explained how I was feeling other than you're overweight and you have a hard job. It didn't, it didn't jive. So uh, a couple of years into it, um, I discovered Whole30 
And I said, okay, clean eating, that sounds like it might be worth trying. It might be a solution. Sounded really great. Read the book, uh, got my partner (laughs) to do it with me. He was like, not exactly super enthused, but he did it. Solidarity. Uh, And at the end of it, I did not feel better. And everyone's talking about this dragon's blood and feeling so great and energized. And I kind of didn't have any energy. And a good friend of mine, Janelle, shout out to her. She's an RN now, but she wasn't at the time. Uh, We were kind of talking about it. She had done Whole30 and we met in the Whole30 forums. She said, have you heard of keto? I was like, no, what, what is that? And she described it. I'm like, well, it kind of sounds like Adkins. It's sound. She's like, no, no, no. It's moderate protein, high fat, low carb. And she said, it's protein, veggie, fat. I said, okay, I'll try anything. So I started a keto journey that at first did not go well because I had poor guidance, poor to no guidance. I was following people on, that I found on the internet, willy nilly, kind of crazy. Then I read Jimmy's book and I'm like, okay, maybe I have a little more of an understanding of this. What struck me about keto that was so interesting is the pathophysiology jived so well with what I know about pathophysiology mm-hmm. and the way that human metabolism works. And calorie restriction does work, but is that pleasant? Does anyone want to live like that? It's rough. <laughs> so it's horrible and you're hungry all the time and mm-hmm. it's not sustainable. And people keep telling me keto is not sustainable and I laugh at them. But anyway, <laughs> Um, sometimes that's semantics too, right? Oh, exactly. I mean, the, the messaging on diet is absolutely trash in this country. We, we polarized it like we polarized everything else. And I found as a nurse, when you talk to people in plain language that they understand and you meet them where they are with their understanding level, with everything, I mean, the conversation becomes so much easier. Anyway, so I started doing keto and I lost some weight and I felt a little better not perfect, still had some lingering weird stuff going on. My hair was still falling out, energy issues like crazy, um, achy joints, depression, anxiety, things I was just really struggling with. Some of that I'd struggled with my whole life, especially my weight. Uh, And I read L. Russ's book, uh, The Paleothyroid Solution. Love Elle, yeah. And uh, Elle's amazing. Elle's a friend. I love her dearly. And um, so I read her book and it all sort of coalesced everything I know about science that I've been taught about the human body with what the aha moments I had about metabolism going, Oh my God. Yes. Fat metabolism, animal based metabolism is more efficient in the human body. Yes. And something is wrong with me. Something is legitimately wrong with me. I got worked up appropriately. That wasn't easy to find a practitioner that would work me up appropriately. It was almost a year journey. Specifically the thyroid, right? Oh yeah. It was, it was almost entirely the thyroid. Um, I am really fortunate. One of my best friends is my OBGYN. So getting labs was a little easier than it is for most people. And so she was just like, I don't understand this. I don't know why you're doing this. It's your TSH is fine. Your T4 is fine, blah, blah, blah. And she ran a reverse T3 at my begging and said, I'm not treating this. I'm not interpreting this. Do with it what you will. And it came back in the 20s, Hmm. uh, which is very high, very, very high. Uh, So I started my thyroid journey, which ended up being long because the practitioner that I found to treat me and I could not figure out why we could not get my reverse T3 down. We were doing only T4 at first, Synthroid. And then we switched to a combo. And with all the testing, we found out I have a history of EBV. I didn't know Epstein-Barr virus. So I had some probably chronic fatigue flare going on. Um, I have really bad at that point, hormone dysregulation, really crazy estrogen, progesterone um, dysregulation, DHEAS, which was very high, which is abnormal in women, um, actually drops off as you get older. Um, So we messed around and we landed on T3 only replacement, which is considered a last resort. And most doctors in this country will tell you you will die, which is insane because you won't. (laughs) And lo and behold, over time, as we adjusted and watched heart rate and watched temperature and watched symptoms and got labs, my reverse T3 went down to basically zero. Wow. And 
Yeah. And that was actually my most recent labs where I showed them to L. Ross and she's like, okay, now we're doing something. Congrats. That's amazing. I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I feel really good. I'm on like uh, what we call TID, three times daily dosing. Uh, people don't also understand that T3 is a short acting hormone in your body as opposed to T4, which kind of has a longer half-life. So I do have to dose three times a day on an empty stomach, which can get logistically kind of insane but yeah. what counts as an empty stomach like a couple hours of not eating two hours two, two hours. hours so yeah i i got up early enough this morning before our interview to be able to take my meds and then have my coffee an hour later so you can take your meds and then an hour later have something and if you've eaten it's two hours so so this is a synthetic t3 it, it, it it's cytomel so it's it is a synthetic it is not a um it's not one of the the um like nature thyroid or any of those um it's just regular old manufactured t3 it's working for me and it's relatively easy to get um if someone's prescribing you and it's it's a cheap medication i think it's like with insurance i think i pay five dollars for it or something it's crazy wow. and the fact that there's people out there that are suffering so terribly with this and it keeps getting told over and over, you're fine. You're fine. You're, you're not losing weight because you don't exercise. You're not losing weight because you're lazy. You're tired all the time because you don't eat right. You're tired all the time because you're getting older. And none of that is true And you, when you optimize diet and hormones. None of that's true. And it's been a crazy journey. I've lost a ton of weight. Uh, I feel different. I, my, you know, my skin and my hair is healthy again. I'm getting my eyebrows back. Cause you know, you lose the outer third of your eyebrows when you're severely hypothyroid. Um, it's just, it's amazing what it's done for that part of my journey. Right. And in helping other people and coaching over the last couple of years, I've seen not just thyroid, I've seen phenomenal turnarounds in chronic inflammatory illness that, um, they blow me away they blow me away. But knowing these things got me away from uh, acute bedside medicine. And I was a, I was special, my specialty was cardiac. And I couldn't give people bad advice anymore. It just, it was morally injuring me. I, I would have patients that would be like their third hospitalization in two months. And they would say, I'm doing everything right. And I think we're kind of conditioned in medicine, you know, like the doctor house thing, patients lie, you know, we're kind of conditioned to feel like they're not really being forthcoming with us when they say they're doing everything we told them to. And over and over, I saw patients who in earnest were following the American Diabetes Association dietary recommendations or, you know, doing everything we're asking them to do. And they're getting fatter and sicker and fatter and sicker and fatter and sicker. And when I had my aha about metabolism, sending that 42 year old woman home on a statin <laughs> made me want to cry. Yeah. So I had to move away. I, I, I do a different specialty now that I don't confront it quite as much anymore, but it definitely is. Um, it's hard. It's hard to like be on the other side. And I, I can sympathize in some ways because uh, my mother I've mentioned before is a nurse practitioner who also has had thyroid issues. And um, for her, managing a job where you can actually heal people was pretty much the biggest challenge of her career. She had worked in ERs and, and worked with doctors, started her own practice a couple of times and just like had to bounce around because eventually it would turn into this thing where she she wasn't able to do the healing that she wanted to do, especially not in, in anything close to her way. And that story is more common than, than it should be. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of moral injury in medicine right now. And I think that what's interesting is a lot of us didn't experience it on a daily basis because you're doing, I want to emphasize like the fact that conventional medicine is so off on a few really key things isn't because anyone's bad. It's not because they're malicious or unintelligent. It's just the mainstream gets passed down as this is what we do. And it gets passed down over and over and over again. And I think the COVID pandemic kind of showed people the flaw in their thinking as far as how medicine's very broken. 
um, and how the medical system is very broken in wanting to do the healing that you want to do. And the fact that prevention is always better than cure. And we don't focus on prevention. Prevention isn't a thing in this country right now at all. And part of that is the systemic dietary recommendations that are across the board. Yeah. And I heard you, this is super tragic when I heard you say on uh, an interview with our friend, Jimmy Moore, shift, you're shifting away from preventative care because everyone is already sick in America. And, and, and basically allopathic medicine is shifting away from preventative care for that reason, which is pretty fatalist, isn't it? I mean, like literally. It's not a conscious decision. And I think I told that to Jimmy, like, it's not like people are sitting around going, okay, we can't handle preventative. It's the fact that the system is not set up for preventative care. You're, you're not meeting people where they are with preventative, lifelong, holistic care in the sense that you're looking at what is your relationship? What is, are you in a food desert? Are you cut off from fresh food? Do you have a financial barrier to eating in the way we're asking you to, given that the way we're asking people to eat is terrible? But anyway, um, there's there's things that are not addressed because we are constantly getting that congestive heart failure patient six times a month that's probably from a low-income community and can't afford certain things that will keep them out of the hospital. We're getting uh, this these young diabetics, um, who keep going into, into diabetic ketoacidosis and getting readmitted because they don't have access to food. That's going to keep their glycemic index low at all. Um, it's, it's really sad and it's a, it's a paradigm shift that needs to happen. I don't think it's a conscious decision that was made. I think if we get more towards what, um, Zubin Demania, ZDog MD, I love that guy, what he calls healthcare 3.0. Um, what he refers to as taking medicine away from strictly for profit and how the insurance companies have so much control over how and why we do certain things as hospitals, as practitioners, not so much nurses. We're kind of, <laughs> we're the low man on the totem pole. We, we do what evidence-based practice tells us to do and what the doctor orders. But I think for mid-level practitioners like nurse practitioners and for physicians, you're really governed by what you get paid for what, what will get, you know, you can't treat somebody for free and for profit medicines, killing people. I, I don't know quite how we get away from that, but we need to, we need to, it's, it's murdering people. You're doing it, not murdering people. You're part of the solution that, that transition from, we need a hub between some sort of support of coaching for preventative care, uh, some sort of management of symptoms there as well, which which someone like you would be able to do, treating someone with a medical condition to some degree, whereas I can't come close to that. We need people who are on, on really every side of this on the prevention side. But then what's what's also critical is, is hooking in to something within Western medicine, hopefully, where we can all talk to each other and maybe agree about what might be bring the best outcomes. There needs to be a meeting. I mean, there's there's an idea in medicine, um, collaborative care, something that gets thrown around a lot. Um, and that, in theory, does mean the physician and the nurse and the physical therapist and the dietitian and, you know, everyone has a stake that is equal in this conversation. And I think that when that happens in practice, it's fantastic. If we could have it happen in practice where we're actually implementing things that do heal people, as opposed to me passing a tray to a diabetic with 64 grams of carbs on it because they need carbs, um, that would be fantastic. But being, I do specialize, my favorite people to treat are people with chronic illness because I like the challenge and I like showing them it's not forever. I think some people get resigned to it. Uh, I had a client who's 73 years old and Michelle thought she'd had a really complicated health history. She'd gone through breast cancer twice, a mastectomy. Uh, she had Barrett's esophagus from the radiation from the first round of breast cancer, um, some cardiac electrical conduction issues, some arrhythmia stuff that she had an ablation for back in the nineties. Like she'd been through a lot and you look at her and she's a normal weight, petite woman not a whole lot going on as far as like what would look like metabolic damage. But as we started talking, 
she was a sugar junkie. She just didn't know it. She was putting sugar in a salad dressing because it tasted a little bit better. Uh, and she was, there was hidden carbs in almost everything she was cooking, even though I cook my own food and I'm, I eat healthy. And her triglycerides were 300 when she came to me. Ooh. And we slowly, in a stepwise manner, took the carbs down, took the carbs down, took the carbs down, got all those hidden carbs out of the diet, whole foods, whole foods. She was afraid of keto. That, that word was very scary to her. And we got her to the point where she was definitely in ketosis and her triglycerides are now uh, 78. Wow. One year later. From 300. One year. That's incredible. One year. It's amazing. It's amazing. It actually, I, I think the, the biggest change was in only six months was, was the, the blood test change, but she lost a little bit of weight around her middle that she had. The IBS that was chronic is gone. The Barrett's esophagus pain that she was having to medicate with benzodiazepines is gone. Um, she's amazingly transformed. And this is a 73 year old person at that point, you know, modern medicine gives up on people at that point. We go, Oh, well, this is what they have. Let's manage the symptom. And there's, there's another way. You've mentioned before that disease is multifactorial. And especially when you're trying to just shoot at symptoms with pills and just throwing pills at all these different symptoms, uh, especially for someone who's later in life, that, that, how is that supposed to heal them? How is that supposed to result in anything other than kind of early death and, and a grim? I think we've forgotten what we learned in the playground in kindergarten that the hip bone's connected to the leg bone <laughs> right. and that idea in medicine that there is absolutely no separating these so the, these systems are so integral to one another and sometimes interact in ways that you're like really you know when you, when you go down the, the rabbit hole and and look at things that you know we're forced to learn in school nurses and doctors and pas and nps are forced to learn metabolic pathways and all sorts of things in school and then it kind of doesn't really affect your daily practice but i loved that stuff <laughs> i loved it and when i started looking at some of this stuff i'd have you know holy crap moments where i'd be like i gotta call somebody i gotta call my mom um who's a nurse also she's retired oh cool and it's amazing when you realize how elegant the system is and how our environment, how modern life has completely, I want to say a bad word, but screwed Yeah. <laughs> how we're meant to function and how our bodies interact with nutrients and light and sleep <laughs> and our sex hormones. All of it is just, we, we've, we've really screwed the pooch. We have for, about a hundred years. And we can, we can fall apart in so many different ways, but the lifestyle based solution kind of cleans up a lot of issues that are just, they look so different in people, right? But then all of a sudden, once they start going away and going away at the same time, health looks pretty similar. Yeah. I mean, when you look at incidents of heart disease and cancer a hundred years ago, and you have to adjust for population size. Cause obviously there's a lot more people living in this country. Now the incidence was so much lower and all we were living on was animal based products that we probably grew. It, uh, you know, the, the cow was living, but that's my grandmother. My grandmother is my grandmother's 94. She's a first generation Armenian immigrant. She grew up in Boyle Heights and, and Culver city here in Los Angeles for locals who know. And that, they had a farm. They had a farm. They had a cow named Bessie. They had their own chicken. Her mom made their own cheese from scratch. And she's the one that's like keto. Oh God, what's that? You're going to kill yourself. I'm like, nanny, you grew up on keto. That's why you're 94 and you're still kicking around with your brain intact. And it's, it's how that whole food approach was how we all lived. It's how we all live with various sliding scale. There's no one size fits all. And I think genetics play a role. Um, I think what works for me doesn't work for another person as far as macro, you know, the sliding scale of how many carbs a day, or how much fat I need to have energy versus you. Um, and that's part of my coaching is there's no like prescriptive here, here's what you're going to do. And it's going to fix you. It's okay. Let's try this. Oh, okay. We're adjusting your carb level. Oh no, wait, we need to walk back on the fat a little bit. Let's up your protein. 
because it's the template. Protein, veggie, fat, template works for every human living on this earth right now. Absolutely. No questions asked. It's just a matter of what ratios. Yeah. And so the issue with uh, keto really taking off and marketers getting a handle on it and then just spinning it in all these different ways and slapping it onto products. When, uh, when I hear the word and when other people hear the word and when you hear the word, it's different in everyone's mind, like what, what it means. But let's, let's dial that back in history a little bit to what it's supposed to mean. And then we can come to, I think, you know, a more reasonable conclusion about what it, what it should mean today. <laughs> Totally. And I think, I think Ken Berry, Dr. Ken Berry is on the right track, calling it a proper human diet. That's kind of how he's rebranding um, what he's the, the education that he's giving to people. And I think that um, that's the right track. I, I ancestrally appropriate proper human diet, um, those things. I just tell people when they're going to go to their physician and they're afraid of what their doctor is going to say when they're on this extreme diet, just I, I'm eating a whole food diet. Don't go deeper than that. I'm eating a whole food diet. I cut out processed food. And the truth is, even if you don't go to a, a carb level where you're in a state of ketosis, if you cut out processed foods, you're going to be healthier than you've ever been in your life. It, you don't have to eat a ketogenic protocol. I'm not saying it's for everybody or that it's optimal health for everybody. We, mileage may vary. For me, it's I can't live any other way and have a good quality of life. My optimal quality of life requires me to be in a keto ketogenic state. Um, it's the processed food, man, all these seed oils and just all this garbage that we, I mean, I'm 41. My whole childhood in the eighties was garbage food, garbage food. And my mom tried to fight it to her credit. I mean, she, she made my baby food by hand for going to say, but when I think about what we ate as children, the little, you know, snacky, cheap plastic cheese snacks with, with pretzels to dip and all that crap we took to school. It's, it's not shocking to me that now about two generations later, I'm looking at five and seven year olds that are morbidly obese. Like it's not a mystery. It's not a mystery. It's not failed parenting. That shaming of parents is really scary because it's a lack of education and maybe a lack of resources. And we need to explore that as a society. And as a medical profession, we need to explore that side of it. And these these modern foods that you can just buy for cheap everywhere will blow out our biology, right? Like it'll it'll destroy our organs and systems if even if you just have it for a short time in great quantity, like some of the kids in the past eighteen months. Oh, of course, and that yeah. Again, you've got the last eighteen months have been really um, interesting, even though horrible from a science perspective, if you step back, it's really interesting because you've got people under financial stress they were not in two years ago. Um, you've got people who might be experiencing houselessness that they weren't experiencing two years ago. You've got maybe one income went, two incomes went down to one, lots of things, right? Maybe you lost family members. Maybe there's people there that were there that aren't there anymore. Okay. It's affecting how we do everything. And it's, the mental health aspect of that. And not just, I mean, trust me, you're hug your local healthcare worker. We're, we're a mess. We're working through the legit trauma that we've all experienced, but people are suffering and I cannot extricate poor diet from the mental resilience aspect Absolutely. of this because it changes. I mean, it changes every biochemical reaction in your body, dopamine and serotonin come from what you eat. You, you synthesize your neurotransmitters from your diet. I mean, I haven't seen a solid study on it, but it's emerging science and it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. So yeah, I think the last 18 months have traumatized the world and I was really hoping it would burn it all down as far as the paradigm we're living under now. And it has not. Um, but I think it's opened a lot of eyes that what we have now does not work. It's poked a few holes, poked some huge holes. And then, you know, again, you talked about being on both sides. I'm on both sides of a couple ish, huge issues. Like I am hugely supportive 
of the mRNA vaccine science and all of that with COVID. At the same time, I see the fact that a lot of these people got sick and died because we failed them for 5, 10, 15, 20 years as their metabolic health is garbage. Yeah. So yes, healthy metabolism is protective against inflammatory illness, which COVID is probably the most inflammatory illness we've seen in a hundred years. But we need medicine to mitigate that too, because it's it's not the whole picture. It's huge though. It's huge. Yeah. Huge. How much you look at people's charts that are in the worst, the worst beds in ICU the sickest people, the people on ECMO, you know, the people that are vented diabetes, it's metabolic syndrome, Mm -hmm. diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity. And these, we didn't really have these things a few hundred years ago. These are pretty new. Yeah. It's, it's modern life. I mean, we talked about the food. We don't sleep enough. We don't honor our circadian rhythm whatsoever. Uh, We're getting blue light from everywhere. So our pineal gland doesn't know what the heck to do half the time. And stress. Human beings were not meant to live in this constant contact with everything, These our phones. And again, I'm not preaching. I'm guilty of it. My phone is like usually in my hand. Um, But we're not meant to live like that. There's supposed to be quiet moments. (laughs) Yes. There's supposed to be very serene moments in most of our day. And when I started looking at personally... Um, like using my Fitbit data and looking at a work day and looking at how elevated my heart rate is most of my work day. No wonder my cortisol is ridiculous, no matter what right. I do. Yep. No wonder my DAEAS is ridiculous, no matter what I do. In addition to my own like inborn anxiety issues that I have had since I was nine years old. Oh my gosh, like we, we're not built for this. This is not... This this world is not for us. So we have to mitigate it smartly. And diet is the number one quickest way you can mitigate it. And uh, it's interesting that you say that. I was wearing a uh, continuous glucose monitor and I was looking at one particular day where it just went nuts. It went nuts, just off the charts. And it's like, I didn't eat there. I didn't, I didn't do a major workout. What happened? And I like chased it back in my Google Calendar. I'm like, Oh, I got really, really mad. That's what happened. I got super mad. And it just hijacked my whole physiology. Uh, a really close friend of mine who who is a nurse practitioner, she's a nurse midwife, nurse practitioner. She got her hands on one and we went to Disney here in California and we just walked around all day. Lots of activity. I think we did um, somewhere around 11 miles that day in the end, but she ate whatever she wanted. I was the ugliest looking. Really? She had highs and highs and lows and lows. She was, you know, up almost in the 200s and then down in the 50s, like an hour later. And like, what is happening? Just eating the Disney food? Yeah. Yeah. Was there anything that surprised you there? Like some was way worse than others food wise? Actually, you know, what surprised me is what brought her glucose down. Um, again, this is N equals one, not, not hypothesizing this is true for anyone else, but like she had a glass of red wine and her blood sugar dropped. How is that even possible? That's happened to me. Yeah. Right. I think it's a, it's a universal phenomenon. It has to do something with like the, the alcohol, which is not, has no nutritional value at all. Kind of mitigating the sugar and the fermented grape. I don't know, but her, her, her lows surprised me compared to what I would expect her to have a little spike from. Um, but yeah, it's Halloween time where she's eating Halloween candy and it was, it was fun to watch. It was kind of interesting. I would love to do my own experiment. I, I want to, I really love, I love CGMs. I think they're a great tool. Fantastic tool. If you can get your hands on one, they're a little cost prohibitive right now. Yeah, they are. Um, but each each of us is an individual. There is a uh, there is truth to the fact that we all need something that's a little bit different. And when we get these one size fits all top down recommendations, it doesn't always translate. It doesn't always help everybody. So maybe you can riff on that because I hope that's where preventative care, and I think it is, as well as allopathic care goes, because we we need to do this now. A hundred percent. Yes. Able. Yes. Um, 
nothing in medicine and physiology and your body chemistry is the same as the next person. Even your siblings or your first degree relatives, like your parents, you may respond differently. Like we just talked about CGMs. I could pop on a CGM and eat something and my mom could do the same and we could have a completely different metabolic journey with that. And so very, very prescriptive, didactic things and very hard line recommendations like never eat fruit. Like you'll, you'll see, you know, hardcore keto carnivore people. I, I used to be one of them. I have exceptions. I, I can't eat a lot of it, but there's some people that do fine with it. It's not a huge blood sugar spike. It doesn't derail them mentally. There's no, there's, there's no downside. So I've noticed in medicine, in all my years in medicine, you know, there's a specific dose of a specific medication for a specific indication, and it's the same for everybody. And I think dosing my thyroid in the last year has been the most eye opening experience in my life because it's taken, even though I was already thinking one size fits all doesn't work for diet and lifestyle, um, it doesn't work for our hormones either at all. And um, I have zero data to contribute as to whether or not it works for things like blood pressure medications or whatever. But I can tell you statins are for not for about 99% of the population, yet tons of people are on them. And you've got this idea that we can just say, I think it's a cost thing. I think it's a convenience thing. I think we're a gigantic country with a lot of people in it. And it's easier to say, this is what we recommend. Just do this. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in diet. It doesn't work in lifestyle and it certainly doesn't work in Western medicine. And doctors don't have the ability to sit there and figure that out with their patients. And it's not their fault. The system sucks. The amount of patients you have to see in your office in a day to keep the lights on is informing how much time they're spending, how much they're able to delve into who that person in that chair is versus that list of that problem list, you know, in the electronic health record. So in my coaching, I've been able to sort of heal my moral injury a little bit and being able to look at these problems that people are having that the proper medical management, in most cases, unless it's thyroid, then it's usually not proper medical management, but with their physician, this is a team effort. I'm not surplanting medical care. I'm not getting rid of it. I'm not instead of it with their proper medical care, I can come in and I can optimize. I can move things. I can adjust because we're all different. What works for me isn't going to work for you necessarily. And I can't sit here prescriptively. And anyone who does is lying or trying to sell you something. Anyone in the health space that says, do this and you'll have this, do this and this will happen. That's not authentic or in any way ethical because we are all different. And I think my Whole30 experience is a really good example. I recommend Whole30. I love Whole30. I think it's a great jumping off point for people that have been on a standard American diet and eating garbage. I think it's a great place to start. Did it make me feel better? No, because I need less carbs. And I had to go through a journey to figure that out. So if you have someone like me, instead of going through the weeds yourself, like I did for years and suffering extra, like you don't have to, um, having the appropriate coaching to kind of dive in there and make adjustments in lifestyle and diet where your doctor's also managing whatever's going on over here with autoimmune, type two diabetes, gestational diabetes, although that gets a little interesting because people don't like to put pregnant women on low carb diets for some reason. Um, I think that that will change. It's a band-aid. Practitioners like me are a band-aid. The whole paradigm needs to shift. But in the meantime, there's people like me. Unfortunately, that's not financially accessible to that 67-year-old congestive heart failure patient that I used to treat in downtown LA that was on and off skid row every other you know, week. That's not feasible. So the paradigm has to shift and we all need to work together to shift the paradigm. But in the meantime, I'm going to do my best to meet people where they're at and try to get them to where I was able to get, which is beyond my wildest dreams of recovery because I was sick, fat, miserable, depressed, exhausted all the time. And I thought that was my life. I thought, oh, this is 30. And it didn't have to be that way. 
And it took people like Ken Berry and Elle and Jimmy to open my eyes. And I can't, I can't look back, which means I'll probably never work in the ICU ever again. Cause I can't, I can't do it. But you probably had to take some, some mental or emotional risks, right? When you first went diving into keto and, and eating more protein or more fat or even more veggies for some people can be really intimidating. So what was that like kind of mentally, emotionally for you? Yeah. So what nurses are taught in nursing school with nutrition is the food pyramid, a hundred percent. What we're taught about diabetes is thank God the ADA is moving away from that. They're acknowledging that low carb is acceptable um, treatment modality, not the only one, but acceptable. Okay. But we're taught all the crap that was ingrained into everybody who's, you know, living on this planet right now, who's about 30 and up low fat, all the snack wells stuff that we had in the nineties, so total garbage, such garbage food. Right. So I, it was hard to add butter to things. You're like, it's weird. It was, it was difficult to dive into that steak and not think, oh, it's a little too much red meat this week. It yep. went away pretty quickly, though, because I could tell how happy my body was. Whereas anything else I've ever tried in my life to try to lose weight or be healthy didn't feel good. So I think my body's response to it helped me make that adjustment quicker. But like my patient, Michelle, that I just told you guys about my client, not my patient, different, different practice level. Um, my client, Michelle, that I told you about at 73, that low fat's all she's ever lit. Calorie restriction and low fat was the only thing she ever lived under in her entire life. And getting her to add fat to this day is a little difficult. <laughs> it's a little hard. And she's lost a little more weight than I'd like her to because it's hard for her to add the calories in fat um, because she needs she's burning off too much body fat for energy. She needs a little more dietary fat. So that, that paradigm shift in your head, I mean, I've sat in my own nurse's station so many times and my coworkers are, uh, either appalled by me or, you know, concerned for my welfare. And, um, it's, it's crazy. Cause that's what we're taught. That's what we're taught. And if any of them sat down with me long enough, you know, to go old school, let's go Krebs cycle. Let's go metabolic to the, the tiniest infinitesimal unit of energy, ATP in the human body. And you look at the efficiency and the byproducts made by carbohydrate versus ketone. It wouldn't take much convincing. And you'd think seeing me get healthier, watching me lose 60 pounds, all of that would convert some people. But they're just, uh, it's interesting that, that what was ingrained into us as practitioners and as I, I can speak as a woman, as a woman in this country um, of a certain age and what we were raised to think was taking care of our bodies is so different. The fact that calories don't matter. You guys can be free of that. It's not a thing. It's not a thing. If you're eating nutritionally sound food, you know, you're not going to have an energy balance problem. And I can't even talk nurses out of that. So it's really hard to talk lay people out of it too. Yeah. Well, it's weird when people have been mostly successful for the vast majority of their lives, right? Doing an approach that is suffering and takes a lot of management, takes a lot of time and mental energy. Um, but neuroticism also isn't good for our long-term health. Not only does it, you know, rob us from quality of life, but it's it's just not good for us either. We die faster when we have mental health problems and, and we can get wrapped up in that side of it really easily too. A hundred percent. It's something I look out for in my clients. Um, I don't want to see unhealthy relationships with food developing just because you're changing something majorly. I think the biggest gift of a low carb, high fat diet is freedom. You might mm -hmm. be doing more food prep you might not be able to swing through the drive through on your way home. But I don't, I used to, I had a binge eating disorder. I would eat and eat and eat carbs till I would die. <laughs> it's gone. All of that's gone. That compulsion to eat for comfort, thinking about food, feeling shame about food. Um, those don't exist for me anymore. 
And people say, I couldn't deprive myself like that. The cravings pass because your body is not, no matter what you believe about what diet or ratio of carbohydrates is appropriate, what's in our food, the food most of us consume mindlessly is multitudes, hundreds of thousands of times more sugar than your pancreas was ever intended to field in one day. And there's, there's no denying that. That's why it, people can, even, even a vegan can be healthier than someone eating a standard American diet and getting zero animal protein. You're going to be healthier than someone who's going through McDonald's three times a day. So getting back to the whole food idea, not obsessing over it, haven't counted a calorie in five years. I haven't, the only thing I keep track of is my carbohydrates. And at this point, it's second nature. I don't have to count anything. I just kind of know where my happy zone is. And my body will tell me if I ever do it. That inflammatory response is very healthy. <laughs> Still there. And underdoing it too, I feel for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't personally don't tend to underdo it. I don't tend to undereat. My body is really um, efficient at metabolizing fat. When I undereat, it would have to be like days or weeks of, of not before I would notice. But uh, that freedom, that freedom is incredible. Food freedom is, is something that, you know, they talk about in Whole30. And I think it's very valuable. I think food should not be something that um, preoccupies us, gives us stress, gives us worry, gives us shame. That needs to go away. And I think that when you're eating things that keep you at a healthy weight just by existing um, and manage your health and manage your inflammation, it goes away. It's, it's like magic. I hate that word, but it's like magic. It just dissolves. When it agrees with your body, it is. It just shifts into that mode and it starts working. And then you don't have to think about it all the time and, and fight your cravings all the time and use up all your willpower. I can totally relate to that. Yeah, it's amazing. It's actually really amazing. And some people have to bump their carbs up. Not going to lie. I, I, I might get someone down to 20 grams a day and they don't feel great. I bump them up to like, you know, 25, see what happens. You find the sweet spot and it doesn't stay static your whole life either. Especially as a woman, hormonal shifts can change, you know, your, your macronutrient demands, um, stress levels, sleep levels. It's, it's a lot of work to figure it out and people don't have time. I think we're all just so used to being so busy. We don't breathe and investing in your health takes time. It, it takes the the willingness to do an N equals one experiment. And it might be a long one. It might be a year or more that you might be trying to figure yourself out. And the willingness to do that is really important if it's going to work for you. Yeah. It's, it's the best thing you could ever do. It will <laughs> improve your life, extend your life, get rid of all the things that are dragging, maybe not all the things, get, get rid of all the things that are messing you up and dragging you down. It's, it's important to take that responsibility and hopefully you can do it earlier because the earlier you can course correct, the less likely you are to be 650 pounds, you know, in 10, 20 years. Correct. Correct. And that course correction, I think, is the problem with modern medicine is we've gotten very accustomed to course correction. Um, and not so much prevention. And the reason is, I think, hot take, our prevention doesn't work. <laughs> Eating a low fat diet with seven to something servings of bread a day doesn't seven prevent. To 11, yeah. Yeah, so, I don't think so. yeah, seven to 11, right? Um, I try to forget. I try to push it out of my mind. I don't want to know. Um, that's not preventative. So prevention doesn't work, not because people suck or they're lazy or they're not following instructions. It's because what we've taught people that prevents illness doesn't prevent illness, period, end of story. So we're not going to get away from, um, you know, course corrective medicine until we correct what's considered healthy, appropriate eating lifestyle changes. It's just not going to change. There'll, there'll be no change. Absolutely. Well, Jessica, I wish I could talk to you for the rest of the day because there's there's so much we could dig into, but we'll just have to have you back. So uh, in the meantime, where can folks find your coaching and, and what you're working on next? Yeah. So um, the, the branding's a little confusing. On Instagram, it's keto underscore nurse underscore Jess. Um, and then um, 
my my coaching company is New Terrain Wellness. Newterrainwellness.com. Um, coaching is its own little tab. You can click on that. I offer one-time co- coaching sessions and also three-month packages. Uh, your consultation's free. If you want to just talk about coaching, see if it's for you, kind of run things by me. I, I give half an hour free consultations, kind of figure out if we are a match for going forward. And I want to offer your listeners today uh, 15% off coaching, all levels of coaching services um, with the coupon code. I wrote it down, FBM15. Nice. Awesome. Thank you for doing that. And uh, yeah, it's... It's hairy out there. We need a lot of people with a foot in both worlds, that hub like you, who can understand the medical world, the language, the terminology, and, and obviously how to heal people. Also, some of the, the problems that might be built, built into that system or baked in, at least right now, and then reconcile that with the world of prevention. We, we just need you more than ever. So anyone looking for a solid coach who knows what she's talking about, go, ches- go check out Jessica's work, please. Thank you so much, Abel. It was such a pleasure. Yeah, it's it's. I've really enjoyed talking with you. I'm sincere when I say let's have you back at some point. A hundred percent. I would love to talk about the system because the system is whole its own conversation. Yeah, maybe when we're allowed to talk about it more, we'll have you back. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Thanks so much, Jessica. You thank you too. Hey, it's Abel one last time, and I just want to say thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Burning Man. Before you go, please smash that like button, hit subscribe, or even leave us a quick review. It helps so much more than you even realize. And if you can think of someone else who you care about, friend, family member, anyone else who might appreciate this free show, then please take a quick second just to share it with them. Word of mouth is really the way that we've grown this show over the years. We have more than, at this point, four awards in independent media, 50 million downloads. We couldn't do any of this without you, so we really appreciate it. If you'd like to get in touch with me, then please follow me under Abel James or Fat Burning Man on your social media platform of choice, and I'll do my best to get right back to you. Now, if you want to keep this show coming to you, you can do something really quickly here. My wife, Allison, and I, along with a very small team, depend on listeners like you to make this show happen week after week. To join our next challenge coaching group or get in touch with me one-on-one, visit fatburningman.com. We also make group coaching free with your subscribe and save orders from our family company, Wild Superfoods, which you can find at wildsuperfoods.com. And if you'd like, you can throw a few bucks into the tip jar as a one-time donation or become a contributing member of our group on Patreon. Just look up Abel James on Patreon and you can join in the fun for as little as a few bucks and get my international best-selling book and audio book as a special thanks. You can also find that page at fatburningman.com slash tip jar. Now, a quick disclaimer for all those legal eagles out there. The Fat Burning Man Show provides general information and discussions about health and related subjects. The information provided in this show or in any related materials are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice, nor is the information a substitute for professional medical expertise, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions and views expressed on this show have no relation to those of any academic, hospital, health practice, or other institution, including corporate overlords. We don't have any of those. If you or any other person has a medical concern, I wholeheartedly encourage you to consult with your health care provider. Woo! Okay. Don't forget to join our newsletter over at fatburningman.com. When you sign up for our email, I'll even send you a wild quick start guide along with a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes, even Allison's famous chocolate nut cookies as a special thanks for signing up. This is Abel James signing off. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week.